The future is a concept. It doesn't exist. As the proverb says, tomorrow never comes. There is no such thing as tomorrow. There never will be. Because time is always now. Welcome to the Philosophical Minds Podcast, the podcast about the stuff we wonder about and other things. Worth the Fight, Acting for a Better World, A Guide to Spirituality, Psychedelic Medicines, and Overcoming Trauma, podcaster at Worth the Fight Podcast, and Psychedelic Integration Coach, Matt Simpson. How are you doing, Matt? Doing great, Sky. Uh, thanks for having me. No problem. Thanks for being here. Um, first off, uh, compliments to your podcast. You're killing it. Um, you've got some excellent guests and conversations. Um, also, thank you not only for coming on my little podcast, but for marching forward boldly and leading the charge on the front lines of this um, quote unquote movement, you know, by just creating a greater awareness as it relates to the understanding of things like spirituality, psychedelics, flow states, meditation, and the, the dynamics and interplay between them all. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, so seriously, thank, thank God for guys like you who are motivating and inspiring and educating the people. And I emphasize the word education as I think that's the key component here for changing the hearts and minds. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. Education, we're uh, retelling the story. Yeah. Uh, the vast uh, retelling and... Um, that, and, and education absolutely is, is a big, big part of all this. So when you, you, you originally worked for America and kind of underwent this huge transition period and I guess all around life transformation into a new mode of being, so to speak, uh, to a more flow oriented style of living. Could you maybe elaborate and talk about your background and where you were and your journey and how you got to where you are now? It's been a wild ride. I was in corporate America in Chicago for 13, 14 years and um, sold a business on my 35th birthday and, and uh, that night I was supposed to be out celebrating and, and uh, you know, uh, being excited about the new venture and the new opportunity and all I could think about was this path of service that I'm on right now. And uh, two months later, I was uh, in the jungles of Costa Rica drinking ayahuasca, uh, having a profound healing uh, experience. Um, I ended up taking 18 months after that experience. Uh, I traveled with a backpack for 18 months. Um, and uh, after I had worked, I had I, you know, closed all of the uh, loose ends from corporate America to, to leave on good terms. And... Um, yeah, it's been, been uh, you know, that, that original healing that I did really brought up a lot of deep um, repressed emotions, uh, some, some deep-rooted hurts that I thought that I addressed, and, um, but it, it, it put them on the front burner, and um, the childhood sexual trauma that had gar garbled up my nervous system and really was at the root of a lot of the uh, dismay and discord that I had in my life. Wow, yeah, I think this... Guy and superorganism, we're all a part of, can definitely use all the healing it can right now, especially during this chaotic and confusing time. The interesting irony is it's 2020, and I thought it was supposed to be the year of clear vision, <laughs> but maybe clarity itself can be somewhat of an illusion, or maybe the clarity is just revealing that a giant, what a giant mess we're in. But one thing I do think that is clearly evident is that there. There's an unfortunately large portion of society still running outdated software in regards to the integration of these neuropsychotropic therapeutic agents or healing modalities. And when I say integration, I'm saying mostly in terms of the mentality, like openness to the science and data and conceptual integration, you know, the societal acceptance, accepting. Um, for many people uh these plant medicines or mushroom medicines have fucking changed people's lives drastically for the better long term and as far as i'm concerned they might be somewhat of a saving grace for humanity in some capacity although 
I'm not suggesting this is the end all be all. I'm, I'm not advocating for the use of these substances in regards to an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex. I'm just saying there's a large blind spot for many people in these areas. It's been largely omitted for far too long. And too many people want to point out the speck in another's eye while not realizing the plank in their own. And this plank I'm speaking of is a plank in the eye of the United States justice system and, and many religious institutions and so on. I mean, we've got pharmaceutical companies running wild with antidepressants and opiates. We've been dumping billions into these cancer research foundations for years. And for what do we have to show for it? It's barely moved the needle on the dial of progress. Anyway, I just, I just want people to see beyond the propaganda of the 60s and know that many of these substances are game changers if done correctly and with that being said keeping in mind that these substances need to obviously be respected and kind of on that note um, let's talk a little bit about how individuals can go about partaking in some of these experiences correctly um, how important are things like set and setting? What kind, what's, what's the importance of like preparation? I mean, I guess it'd probably depend on what it is, whether it's something like ayahuasca or psilocybin, but what are your thoughts on that? Can you speak to that? I think, yeah, absolutely. And, and everything that you're saying is very, uh, you know, spot on and, and, um, you know, in, in terms of, of set and setting, the, uh, it's, it's paramount. And I think that that's the game changer. That's the difference. Uh, and, and that is why uh, this uh, psychedelic renaissance is, is going to uh, push forward and slowly uh, overhaul our broken uh, Western mental health uh, paradigm. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it wasn't um, emphasized, I, I think, in the, that, was, that was the big gap or the big hole in the 60s and 70s. And, and uh, we're, we have a different uh, level of education now, and 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 uh, the science is very very strong, and um, you know we're looking at these compounds and we're looking at this healing differently. Um, the you know the 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 flow science, which which we've uh, you know I, I know are, are both uh, very very enamored by Stephen Kotler's work, and and um, I think is is a game changer in this equation as well, and that wasn't available. That breadth of research wasn't available in the '60s and '70s. So um, you know, there's all sorts of really good, powerful signals, but but absolutely, set and setting is 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 paramount. That we, um, as Tim Ferriss would say, um, approach this like a like you're you're going to get brain surgery, and 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 treat that with the same reverence, and and do your research, um, and uh, go out and and um, you know, find, read books and, and, and watch documentaries. There's, there's just an absolute load of content to uh, enlighten our, um, our minds and, and um, to really bring the, uh, the data points that I think are, are uh, paramount for uh, before engaging this, this uh, transformational experience to have these proper data points, uh, this uh, fodder for your uh, subconscious mind. So when you're really deep in these journeys, you can you can organize the um, uh, the a, a mapping of of um, the best way uh, forward and the best way to be the uh, you know to bring forth in time the best version of yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, I I definitely agree. It seems like we're definitely have an opportunity to have some kind of psychedelic renaissance like you said and yeah Stephen Kotler is he's excellent he's got many great books um how do you you know how, how does set and setting differ in regards to say ayahuasca versus something like psilocybin or do they what, what are some general rules of thumb from your experiences when undergoing some of these uh journeys? Wonderful question. Um, and I think that, that um, the set and setting is built in the ayahuasca experience. Uh, and that is why uh, it is a, a total game changer for trauma, whether it be, uh, you know, I, I always say that that's mother nature's equalizer for trauma, whether it be childhood sexual trauma, whether it be war trauma, whether it be uh, just any kind of uh, deep rooted trauma, um, child, just uh, other, other variations of childhood trauma. And um, 
yeah, yeah, you're, you're going to prepare very differently for an ayahuasca uh, ceremony. But again, the, the, the ritual is built in, the set and setting is built in the ayahuasca. You're, you're in a safe, supported container when you're, uh, you know, doing it with a trusted group or a trusted shaman. And, um, you know, the ground rules are laid out and uh, the expectations are very clear and, and of, um, you know, allowing you that um, that safety to really, really go within and to feel what needs to be feel, felt to to honor the full spectrum of emotions and and um, to reprocess whatever that hurt may be to recontextualize that in that safe setting. But um, yeah, the psilocybin that the the uh, the plant spirit uh, or the plant impression or, or whatever you want to call it is is a lot more. Uh, I think my experience has been it's it's a lot more playful. Um, it can be very very deep and therapeutic as well. Uh, of, of course, you know we're all um, keeping an eye on that incredible research that's being done at Johns Hopkins, at uh, Imperial College of London, UW Madison uh, that is that is really showing um, NYU for the end of life um, cancer patients that are using this to 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 die with dignity, and uh, you know it's poised to make its way through the um the clinical trials and through um you know as it, it doesn't have the cultural baggage that that lsd has but uh but yeah definitely the um you know each each compound or each medicine is is going to have to be looked at in a different in a different light and um and, and respected and and um Definitely. It, it's definitely beautiful to see that happening with the clinical trials. And, yeah, in terms of uh, preparation, maybe on like the physical le level, how how do things like diet play into it? I'm aware with things like ayahuasca, there's often like a purge associated with it. And I, I would assume that maybe your diet would maybe help or hinder <laughs> that. Is that your experience as well? Yeah. or would it... Absolutely. Uh, diet is, is um, you know, it's recommended best practices uh you take a week or two and basically abstain from um red meat ab abstain certainly uh the the 48 hours leading to it uh leading up to the to the ceremony um abstain from salt and sugar um alcohol sex uh, basically anything that really stimulates you um energetically is is something to uh push, push back or, or, or to abstain. I, I call it a, a strategic withdrawal. Uh, I'm, I'm not a big believer in the, uh, in an abstinence model, um, whether it be before, um, or, or, uh, but, but yeah, it's, it's important to, to hold this time, um, as a, um, almost as if it's part of the, the ceremony itself. So if you have a, um, you know, ceremony, uh, you know, you factor in the two weeks before and the two weeks on the back end. So it's basically a month long ceremony that you're preparing for. Wow. Now from um, the researchers you've interviewed and the people you've had discussions with or your own personal experiences, what are some of the common threads in terms of the common takeaways from ayahuasca sessions or mushroom sessions? What are some commonly reported notions. I think the um, the life review, or going back to, um, I mean, the life review is is, is something that is is uh, I, I haven't done a boga, but is is very much uh, talked about with a boga. Um, I've I've had um, I've had that with ayahuasca, and um, and it's something that I hear about is is uh, the. I think the most common thread is is going back to that memory, to that uh, that hurt, to that pain, to that trauma that is so often repressed, and we uh, we we push it off to the side and we move on with our lives, and we don't honor that hurt. And um, these sacred medicines give us the opportunity to go back uh, to that moment in time in our life and feel safe to engage that. Um, to engage that hurt and, and really the, the magic with this therapy is that, is that it allows us to reprocess that emotion and to feel it in a safe setting 
um, you know, cry the tears that needed to be cried, maybe have a scream that needed to scream and, and honor the trauma cycle, uh, and then sh- shake ourselves off and, and, and get on with our lives. Definitely. Yeah. That would, go ahead. Oh, go. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that, that, that with the aboga, that's fascinating too. And I believe I heard about Ibogaine from, I think it was Aubrey Marcus. Um, and the way he explained it, it was like, wow, it, pretty heavy and intense and unpleasant but the end result it definitely seemed very therapeutic and cleansing for you know not mentally and healing those past traumas so that's that's really interesting absolutely a, a true reset button for addiction uh, is boga i also feel the same way that that, that these other compounds are but but uh boga certainly or ibogaine is known as the granddaddy of of uh, addiction therapy wow yeah how beautiful is that and And in regards to speaking to like traditional Western Judeo-Christian foundations, if you want to talk about communion with God, (laughs) if you want to commune with God, folks, and really tap into that unity consciousness or Christ consciousness, so to speak, uh, this seems kind of like where the rubber hits the road and also definitely seems to be somewhat of a catalyst for getting oneself fit for service. And, you know, that, that I mean, this is something you often speak about uh, being fit for service. Could you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? Mm, I love that. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and yes, this is a, um, these uh, peak psychedelic experiences uh, do give you access to that. It's, a, it's experiential spirituality. You don't have to, um, you know, take anybody's word for it. You just merge with whatever that is. And um, it, it's profoundly uh, therapeutic. Absolutely. And in, in terms of uh, fit for service and, and yeah, I mean, I, I think that that is our, our true nature is, is one of um, caring and loving and um, serving others. And we are so cut off from that often here um, in the West. And, and the, these experiences are, are profoundly therapeutic and, and, uh, these, these medicines can be, they can be visionary where you can see like that, that therapeutic session that I had back in December of 2014 that I'd referenced uh, earlier on in this call. Um, it was a, it was a profound visionary experience where, uh, from this place of true peace, I could see forward and see not in like some, Nostradamus, uh, fortune telling way, but I could see forward in a, um, Hey, if I keep move, moving forward and I keep working my butt off and if I meditate and, and, and do yoga and, and eat healthier, that these things will likely happen. And, um, and, and sure enough, um, in a pretty close manner, you know, that, that, that visionary experience that I had back in 2014 is, has come to fruition and, and I'm living that life. Uh, I, I, I've, I've, I'm embodying that vision of, of this, uh, greater expression, this, uh, this greater Matt Simpson, who is, um, not, uh, stuck in self-abuse, but is, is, um, you know, getting up each morning, uh, with a servant's heart and, and, and asking that question, how can I best serve humanity today? And how can I best um, love at a deeper capacity? How can I give more of my heart to the world? Wow. Yeah, that's beautiful. And um, I really, I really want people to recognize these perspectives. So thank you for that. Um, I think it's really important. And I know the psychedelic mind altering substance thing is kind of a difficult pill for many people to swallow because it feels foreign or outside of the confines of their religious scaffolding, perhaps, or there's the unfortunate notion that, well, this isn't legal, or it must be bad if it's illegal, right? And I definitely get that, and I understand those concerns, but yeah, um, it's, it's interesting because, you know, we're all aware that we shouldn't peer pressure people into doing things they don't feel comfortable with, but we kind of forget at the same time we don't need we we need to be careful about peer pressuring people away from the things they might feel called to do that might benefit them and and you know to be clear i myself for example i i actually go to church regularly and i have a very different take on things than those i'm often surrounded by you know many people with diametrically opposed uh, beliefs and it's a challenge at times but i have reasons why i do 
and I do find value in that experiences and in many ways and obviously many others do as well for whatever their reasons may be whether it's LDS or Christian or Catholic or whatever I think a vast majority of the subconscious motivation around many churches or for example like your yoga studios or CrossFit gyms it's often a way of coming together and tapping into tribal communal instincts um, to connect with one another and there's a lot of beauty in that and that's fantastic and I may not agree with every interpretation the church is preaching or uh, not think the fitness program is perfect of whatever CrossFit group I'm a part of you know I, I very often disagree but I seek to understand and learn from other people's perspectives and I think a lot of learning comes out of that, and I hesitate to identify myself as any one thing, especially when it comes to religion or politics. It's tough these days with any label because just that thing where people say, for example, I'm Christian or I'm Catholic or I'm Republican, they mean so many different things to so many different people. And I, more than anyone, am absolutely opposed to fundamentalism of any kind, thinking my way is the only way and everyone else is wrong, you know. Uh, the, when I say I'm a Christian, it might be drastically different than the rest. If if anything, I, I identify myself as, above all, as a free thinker. Um, and there are many aspects of churches that I like and many I dislike and many aspects of multiple other religions I love and many that I don't. There are many aspects of the legal system that I like and many I dislike. But I'm not one of those people that wants to burn down the church, uh, you know, because of the issues that have occurred in the past or dismantle the legal system entirely because of injustice. You know, I, I'm all about checks and balances. I'm I'm all for freedom of religion and freedom of assembly and the exchange of ideas and battling out ideas. Also, with that being said, I by no means am ignorant to the fact that many churches are melting pots for corruption and Many lawyers and politicians are pieces of shit, but many are amazing and change lives and motivate and instigate positive change in their communities. And whether it be the legal system or the church system, I'll talk about these issues and expose them all day. And I do on this podcast because I'm all about fighting corruption and seeking solutions. And in the same way, I will defend the right of a religion to exist, even though there have been many instances of horrific child abuse associated with it, I will defend one's right to use psychedelic substances, regardless of the instances of, say, schizophrenic episodes that have been associated um, or recorded in correlation, or things like the use of LSD and MK Ultra CIA black programs like Operation Midnight Climax and the Manson murders, for example, because all of these things are not black and white. Um, we don't we don't not drive cars because car accidents happen. <laughs> and, you know, another example, I know you're aware of this. I saw you, you, you posted something on Instagram with the George Floyd situation. It was straight up killed by that shitty law enforcement officer. And that, that infuriates me. And many things absolutely need to change within the law enforcement system. These guys need better training and more vetting and absolutely need to be held to a higher standard of accountability and the answer obviously isn't to eliminate law enforcement altogether, at least not in my estimation. I do think we should have a police force, and I'm all about peaceful protests, but the solution is not violent riots. We can't fight fire with fire. Anyway, my point is uh, we change people's hearts, minds, attitudes, and behaviors first by planting the seeds in their minds, by arming them with the knowledge and the understanding the authentic and genuine testimonies and that's what i really appreciate about you man uh that you know what you're doing that's what i love about the potential psychedelics hold in that regard to really cleanse the ego organically and authentically they seem to really resolve this kind of like team mentality thing uh, to bring us in harmony into a sympathetic vibration or kind of resonance with natural law, so to speak, uh, to strip away many of these bullshit labels that we apply to ourselves and others. Anyway, I'm sorry. I, I'm just ranting at this point, man. <laughs> but okay. it's some, I'm really passionate about that. But um, something I wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, you know, MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association 
Foundation for Psychedelic Studies. Uh, I believe you've had the opportunity to interview Rick Doblin. Um, so they have a strong, strong focus on the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy as a tool for treating things like PTSD and anxiety. I think they've been granted phase three trials by the FDA that could potentially lead to available treatment as early as 2022. So that's pretty awesome. And something I really, I, I don't know the science on exactly. I remember growing up though, hearing stay away from MDMA, it puts holes in your brain. And I don't know if that's actually true or what that exactly means. Do you have any insight into any of that? Yeah, um, perhaps uh, the yeah the MDMA assisted psychotherapies in phase three clinical trials and um, yeah it's a very very exciting time likely to be a legal medicine as it stands right now they have a cure for PTSD and it's likely to be a legal medicine by 2021 2022 and um, in terms of the uh, war on drugs um, just say no dare programming that we had. Um, I don't know if there's any uh, validity to that, if, if it does, uh, I, I think it does the opposite, the way I understand it, um, that this, um, and, and a big part of this psychedelic therapy is, um, and this is something that Rick, Rick always uh, emphasizes, is the, the associated um, psychotherapy that is, um, is, is, is tied to it. And um, I, I think that that is what makes it a game changer. But um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, there are risks, of course. You, you're taking, uh, you know, the, although the risks are far, far less when, when they're done in a therapeutic setting because you're taking pharmaceutical grade um, MDMA and all of the I's have been dotted, all the T's have been uh, crossed. You, you have a therapeutic alliance that has been prepared for with therapy uh, ahead of the time. And, um, you know, the, the, really the, the, um, the patient is, um, the, the healing is set up on a T for them. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's a, uh, you know, it's been labeled a breakthrough uh, therapy by our federal government and it's, it, it's a very exciting time, but yeah, to answer your question, I, I, I don't think that there's, I think that, 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 uh, you know, putting holes in their brain, that's part of the nonsensical, uh, propaganda and, and, um, programming from the uh, Nancy Reagan uh, D.A.R.E. program, I believe. Uh, good time. <laughs> yeah, that's that's so great to hear. Um, and I know definitely with things like psilocybin, it actually encourages neurogenesis to an extent. And so that's, that's really it's fascinating. Um, I'm assuming you have a meditation practice. Uh, what is what does that look like for you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, meditation's really been the glue that's kept and held uh, everything together and has been a, a foundational practice that has absolutely changed my life um, to a degree that it's, it's, it's really hard to even put into words. Um, I, let's see here. Um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, like the first 30 to 40 minutes of the day, I'm doing Wim Hof uh, breath work. Oh, okay. Which, which is a form of active meditation, very powerful uh, breath work. And, uh, and I follow that up with uh, 40 minutes of um, just a letting go meditation, uh, simple mantra meditation. And um, yeah, it's, it's, that's, that's um, especially with, although I've been, I mean, it's been two to three hours a day of meditation uh, since, since 2015 for me. And um, you know, it's a, it's a, a practice that, that grounds my energies and, um, you know, so much of the work that I've done and so much of the, the creativity, um, you know, is coming from these, these deep meditative states that, um, that I believe are the best tool that and, and Wim Hof, uh, for integrating these psychedelic, um, experiences, uh, to, I believe, you know, I kind of take a, take a contrarian view about, um, the psychedelic healing. And I believe that, uh, you know, and this, this really resonates. Uh, Jason Silva had, had used this, uh, this term of inverse PTSD. Many of us that are healing with these psychedelic medicines are, are, are healing from trauma that is in our nervous system. And uh, these medicines allow us to go back and, and access those memories. Uh, Peter Atiyah has got a, a, an awesome quote. Uh, sometimes we can't 
talk ourselves out of things we didn't talk ourselves into. So um, that that notion of, of um, you know, talk therapy will work for, for some things, but when it comes to these deep-rooted hurts and these deep-rooted uh, traumas, uh, they're not going to get at the trauma. And, 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 and there are, I agree with you, that, that sometimes we don't want to fight fire with fire when we're talking, um, you know, politics, but when we're talking psychedelic healing, yeah, and, and deep-rooted sexual trauma or war trauma, you're going to want to fight fire with fire. And, uh, and these tools are really, really powerful, but, um, yeah, the, the, you know, tie this back to Jason Silva's, um, you know, inverse PTSD is I believe that those peak healing experiences that I've had with, um, ayahuasca, with, uh, psilocybin, uh, with LSD, um, are in, are still in my nervous system. And, uh, when I get still, and through meditation, I can access those teachings, access those insights to live a healthier, happier, and stronger life. Wow. Yeah, Jason Silva blows my mind. Um, and so in terms of, you know, embodying that and kind of the after effects of things like uh, meditation or the psychedelic experiences, um, in terms of the long-term effects and benefits what do you see as far as um, how long it carries on, carries forward? Um, do you do you find that it's something that you have to, I mean, I'm sure with the meditation, it's probably something that you do on a consistent basis, but things like, um, you know, the ayahuasca, is it something that you would recommend doing at a consistent interval or I guess would that just kind of depend on the person and their experience? I think that that uh, very much depends on the person and their uh, their their healing journey and their trajectory and what they're seeking to get uh, get from the experience. Uh, on my on my journey I went really deep for uh, two to three years uh, that I was I was um, you know doing doing ceremony about every six months where I would make a trip out of the country and go down to uh, Costa Rica or Peru. And uh, that was a, um, an, a, a, an, an interval that worked for me, um, you know, six go in for deep healing and then have six months to process these, uh, these deep, profound insights. And then, uh, you know, going back for more. Um, but, but yeah, it's going to be very individual for, um, you know, a given person's uh, healing journey. And I think we're, we're, this is something I've been giving a lot of thought to now. Um, of late, this this notion that the the let's say that the Matt Simpson that that healed in 2015 um, and, and engaged ayahuasca is is going to uh, the, the Matt Simpson of 2020. Let's say that the the, the the guy that's duped into living a shitty corporate life and he's out of touch with his uh, his, his truest heart space and, and and values, his experience is going to be very different in 2020. Than it was for me back in 2015 because of that education that we talked about earlier. This is on the front burner. This is something that is, um, you know, it's very close to. I mean, we're a few years away from potentially legalization, and and there's, uh, you know, there's just been all sorts of very hopeful signals that have been sent out. I think that there was some very powerful signals that were sent out uh, last year with the decrim. Um, movement in in oakland and uh denver uh oakland a, a metropolis in our great nation uh, decriminalizing all psychedelic plant medicines uh or all plants so uh and 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 that sent a, a signal to the four corners of our of our big beautiful planet that uh that hey you know um that, that, that times are changing and um and again there's a Big metropolis that looks at these uh, not as a uh, criminal offense, but as uh, a health problem, as opposed to uh, yeah something that, that will be criminalized and you'll throw somebody in, in in jail for seeking that healing that they that they know that they need. Yeah, and further increase their trauma in jail. <laughs> totally, yeah. totally. In, ter in terms of the decriminalization, I never thought I'd see the day, but that that's extremely encouraging. And yeah, on that note. Could, could you maybe share a little bit of your experiences with like things like microdosing psychedelic medicines or what are some of the best practices um, in regards to that as far as your knowledge is concerned? Absolutely. Yeah. Microdosing is, a, is a, that along with set and setting that we talked about earlier is, uh, is another reason why I'm extremely hopeful 
that that that, that this uh, renaissance will just keep pushing forward is that is um, there is a uh, growing uh, upswell, and I'm hearing you know, lots of buzz around microdosing. It's something that has been uh, very helpful for me um, on, on my journey. It has a very, very low risk profile as opposed to a peak psychedelic experience, um, and the benefits are, 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 are profound. Um, so, you know, someone who might not want to uh, go in for a, um, a weekend retreat with ayahuasca or someone that doesn't feel comfortable, t- you know, taking a heroic dose of, of magic mushrooms because they don't want their ego obliterated, they can still find some benefits from these um, these compounds and, in, in, you know, done in a microdosing manner. Uh, there was it was a profound um presentation that that Paul Stamets gave at the Psychedelic Science Summit in Austin, Texas last fall, he was talking about how um, with the peak experience that the the neurogenesis is very, um, or it's it's a lot more present in, um, in the microdosing as opposed to the peak experience. And um, there's a, a stack, his stack, which, which he is as excited about his stack of microdosing, uh, which is um, a very, very low dose of a psilocybin subperception. You're not going to see any visuals or, or it's not going to distort your vision uh, field at all. Um, uh, paired up with niacin um, and uh, lion's mane. And it's his, his thought process that this could be as big for our collective evolution as uh, the, the first discovery of our hominid ancestors discovering um, psilocybin and, and, and these, these mushrooms um, in, in the stoned ape theory. Um, now, you've, you've been at this fight for a while now, uh, and you're an optimist. If you were to kind of guesstimate um the kind of like a trajectory map of where the collective consciousness around psychedelics will be and how they will unfold into our culture what does it look like for for you over the next say five to ten years how do you how do you say it how do you see it playing out well i had when i had rick doblin on the worth the fight podcast i think it was episode number 10 or 11 uh, we talked about this and this was pre uh this was last fall so this was pre uh the the um you know pre-covid and and uh pre-george floyd and uh you know the and i think that everything right now you know i got a, a post that's in my my queue of, of going out is that that notion that someone who pressed the turbo button because i think that everything's going to be accelerated um big time and and his uh his rick doblin who i think is uh, he's got the best uh tra- the um you know pulse on on this movement he he had forecasted uh, 2035 being the uh, year in which we would see a post-prohibition world where uh, all of these compounds will be uh, legal medically and recreationally, and we will have uh, scrubbed that pesky stain uh, and, and, and um, mitigated these erroneous societal programs from the 60s and 70s. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I would imagine that if, if that, that he would say with what's going on in the world that that would be accelerated and maybe cut in half i i don't know um but i would think that this this um there's a pressing need i i I feel like all of our our trauma is is really out in the open right now this this pandemic is is um has got um all of us living on the uh, you know living life on the front burner now you know Uh, so, so many of us um have uh it's death is an equalizer and and this is something that uh, i'm really excited about because i think that that um this there's a massive opportunity here for people to uh to to reevaluate their lives and what what's important to you and 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 why are you here and um because you know it now's the time now's the time to dig in and, and if you got healing to do um you know pucker up that chin and go go do that and and uh you know, there's an incredible amount of resources to uh, ensure that, that this can be done in a safer uh, than ever manner. Of course, there's still risks, and uh, that's why it's so important that we do our do our research. But 
uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely an optimist and I'm, and I'm very excited about these, these times. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity here. Definitely. And you mentioned resources. What are some great resources that you would recommend to people to check out, to kind of familiarize and educate themselves with this subject matter that, that are like resources that you would trust that you find are very helpful? Absolutely. Great question. Um, the, the books that come to mind are Michael Pollan's uh, How to Change Your Mind um, is, is uh, at the top of the list, uh, followed by uh, Jamie Wheel and Stephen Kotler's book, Stealing Fire. I think that, that those books, um, and if you're looking to heal from trauma, and you know that that's, you got something that, like that at root, I would say, hey, throw in Worth the Fight, throw in my book in, in that equation as well from somebody who's walked through the fire on his own personal healing journey. And um, yeah, I mean, that, 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 that would give the aspiring uh, or the, the, um, the curious psychedelic explorer or the ambitious psychedelic explorer uh, all the data points that they would need to ensure that there is, um, you know, that, that, that they're going to have the best percentage or the best best opportunity to have uh, the the, the uh, best possible healing outcome. Uh, and there's there's this is this is very exciting too. I'm seeing all sorts of wonderful signals that um, there's a lot of psychedelic integration coaches. I'm not the only one that's that's uh, doing this this work. And uh, you know, as we're knocking on the door for legalization, there's 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 people that are holding space for for others that, um, you know, I would would think that that um, that engaging a psychedelic coach is going to uh, help uh, the the outcome tremendously because you can uh, we can properly focus on the front end integration and the after effect integration, and um, it's it's again uh, paramount. Um, now, before we go, are there are there any last thoughts that you would like to share with the listeners? Anything that you think is relevant for them to hear? Um, you know, if if you're if you're seeking this uh, this experience and you feel like there's something um, bigger within, um, I would say get still, and and uh, the answers you seek are are, are inside of you. And, uh, you know, turn your phone on airplane mode and turn out the outside world, go out in nature. And, um, you know, inquiry is, 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 is a powerful practice, uh, journaling. And, uh, but there's this, this is a, this is a, a, a healing modality that, um, can really aggressively target, uh, those, those past hurts. And there's, uh, there's again, a breadth of, uh, research and experiences and programs. Uh, for example, I have a worthy fight mastermind uh, program where it's not built around psychedelic um, you know of course psychedelics are illegal but but the psychedelic integration principles are uh, imparted in this mastermind coaching and um, you know find a find a find a guide find a mentor find a coach that, uh, that that can hold your hand through this process and um, you know be careful what you wish for because because it, it just might happen and, and come true these are powerful medicines that uh, have a way of manifesting things in a quick fashion and especially now that, uh, that the turbo button like i said has been pressed with what's going on in our world i think that it's uh, it's never a better time to, to look within to uh, level up yes i would agree um, where can people find uh, your book or information about your coaching or your mastermind program and all of that? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, you can find the book on uh, Amazon, uh, Worth the Fight book, and it's also on Audible as well. And uh, or you can you can get more information about uh, the book, about my coaching, about uh, the, the podcast at worththefightbook.org. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at, at worth the fight book. And I think that that is about it. Awesome. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate you and everything you're doing out there. So yeah, thank you so much. Absolutely. And I, I very much appreciate this time, uh, to, to share and to connect with you, Sky. And, and, uh, you know, I appreciate the work that you're doing and, in, in uh, broaching these very taboo subjects. And I think that's very brave and admirable of you. And I, I, I really, you know, a lot of the things that you'd said, uh, you know, earlier really resonate on a, on a deep, deep level and, and your outlook 
and and viewpoint and um, really the idea of uh, anti dogma is, is is standing out and I admire that uh, you know your your stance and and um, you know the principles that you you stand by and and uh, it's been wonderful again to connect. Thank you, thank you, Matt. Absolutely.